So you ready, Lee? I'm ready. Okay, <laughs> so we're ready. Okay, uh, and I'm Brian Reed, and this is Lee Hartwell. We were asked to introduce ourselves, so here we are. Um, and there will be an opportunity for questions, so if you want to interrupt, raise your hand or grab the microphone or whatever. So uh, one thing, Lee, that I just learned about a decade ago was that, <laughs> well, we've known each other for more than four decades, so that's recent, uh, <laughs> it, it, it is that you were interested in cancer very early in your career, and yet you chose yeast as a model system, and I was curious what uh, influenced that decision. Yeah, it was, uh, um, well, it was primarily due to a failed postdoctoral period. <laughs> um, I spent a year and a half uh, doing a postdoc with Renato de Becco, where we did some interesting work on viruses, but my main effort was to try to um, develop a system with human cells or mammalian cells to study cell division. And um, conclusively showed that I couldn't learn anything that way. <laughs> um, and so, but actually I got, a, I got a grant and a job at the University of California, Irvine to continue that work <laughs> that I knew I wasn't going to do. And um, uh, one afternoon I was talking with Dan Wolf and telling him my problem and he said, why don't you use a model organism? And I said, that's a great idea. So I went to the library and looked for, I wanted a eukaryotic cell. Okay. So I looked for a eukaryotic cell where one could do genetics. And of course, yeast was sort of the only game in town. And uh, Herschel Roman's name was very prominent, uh, and Bob Mortimer, and Don Hawthorne. And so I came up and visited. Um, well, I contacted them by phone and they invited me up. And so I came up and spent a few days with Don and Herschel. And without any experience in yeast or, or genetics, <laughs> <laughs> I decided to give it a try. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and so your approach uh, was not cell cycle specific at all at first. You isolated a very large number of temperature sensitive mutants, and uh, so you were not at all focused on the cell cycle. You were just isolating uh, a bunch of mutants, and you tried to sort them out, and, and the cell cycle aspects became elusive at that point. You know yeah, we, um, we, we, you know, they're, they're looking at macromolecule synthesis and cells and DNA synthesis and stuff, it was clear that there were defects in all the major macromolecular processes. And so we studied some of the ones that we thought we could make some headway in early, which was protein synthesis. But cell division was always what I wanted to study, but we just didn't know how. Okay. And, and <laughs> when you came here, that's what you were studying with protein uh, synthesis and RNA Lidosome synthesis. Ribosome synthesis and stuff like that. And, and um, the, thing, the things I remember, uh, we, we discovered cell cycle mutants one day. And I don't know what you remember about that day. Would you like to reflect on that? Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like a lot of these things where all of a sudden, in an instant, you see what you were looking for, okay? And Brian was an undergraduate in the laboratory then and um, was um, studying some mutants that formed odd shapes. And we decided that it would be interesting to see how they got from normal to abnormal, right? So you started taking pictures of them. And as soon as we looked at the pictures, we realized that we could see the cell cycle because the yeast form a little bud. And so it was, you know, it was like, why didn't we think of this three years ago, you know? And, th and things always happen to me that way, where, I'll, you know, you know what you want to do, but you don't know how to do it, and then all of a sudden it falls in your face. And, and the thing I remember 
uh, is that we, we saw this one day. And the thing I remember is that the next day you came back <laughs> with about a million experiments, most of which involved me taking pictures in the warm room. <laughs> so you came with an armamentarium of things you wanted to do. Uh, did that just all fall into place, or how did? That's not what I remember at all. What, <laughs> what I remember is coming back the next day having cut your pictures into little pieces <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so that he could arrange the cells in the cycle. And I gave, I gave Brian back the pieces. And he goes, well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> now you're getting the inside story. <laughs> the, um, but I do think it's true. At that point in time, uh, we had an entire field at a discovery state. The only thing that existed was the phases of the cell cycle, G1, G2, S, mitosis, G0. And, and how did you feel about that? I mean, there were no pioneers in this field. How did you feel? Well, it was nice because there wasn't a lot of literature to read, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the, th the thing, you seem to be drawing on discoveries that came outside of the cell cycle. Uh, you, uh, uh, I know you're very impressed and might want to comment about your experience with Bob Edgar, and you seem to be drawing on some of those experiences. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, that is really interesting because I, whenever, and we do this frequently, you know, you're sitting around in the evening or something talking to people and ask them how they got started in their career, and it almost always comes down to some person that influenced you. And, um, and, and I've thought a little bit about the characteristics of those interactions, which I think are quite, quite interesting. But um, anyway, for me, I was an undergraduate at Caltech working in Delbrook's group, and Bob Edgar was w working on phage morphogenesis then. And, um, and the whole paradigm of, of figuring out the steps of phage morphogenesis using mutants was always in the back of my mind. And it um, uh, just seemed like such an elegant approach. And, um, and they used temperature sensitive mutants and they used amber suppressor mutants. And so, you know, what we did was really just a direct application of that approach to things. Um, and amazingly, you know, it worked. It was such a, such a, a much more difficult question, you know, to tackle the whole cell. And, and if, if it hadn't been for the eventual development of recombinant DNA technology, that, you know, it wouldn't have gone very far beyond just identifying some mutants. So it was, you know, the, the historical development sort of moved it forward. And I don't remember you using recombinant. How did you use it? Well, that may um, have been after I left. No, yes, Steve Reed came to the okay. lab as a postdoc, and he and Kim Naismith and Ben's lab worked together, and they cloned the CDC28 gene by complementation and did the DNA sequence and everything, and so and and it was one of the first, um, certainly not the first gene clone, but it was one of the first ones done by, was one of the first handful? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and so it was It was really because of, you know, Ben's lab being there and Steve Reed coming from Stanford. Okay. I was afraid of recombinant DNA technology. Yeah, I, I seem to remember <laughs> that. <laughs> I seem to remember that. Uh, and, and so... What are your memories of that first group that that tackled this? Well, I sort of had the same experience, I think, for like 30 years or more. Let's see, from 68 Good. to 98. Yeah, yeah, 30 years. 
which is, uh, you know, what was so much fun was um, just the whole combination of things. One that we had a department where there was there was sort of focused around genetics as an approach to biology, <clears throat> but yet very diverse people in their interests, and so it was a it was a great intellectual environment, and the, the department had just terrific graduate students and. Um, this training grant that is still is the training grant still active? No. no? Um, well, it was active the whole time I was there, and it brought in you know just we, we were able to have a terrific uh, group of graduate students continuously coming through, and and then the third thing was was yeast, you know, which is an organism almost as good as phage in terms of being able to do rapid experiments where you could, in phage you could do an experiment one afternoon and get the results the next morning. If you got up early you could do the, actually get the results the next e the same evening. But with yeast it was about a two year turn two, two day turnaround. So it could take two days for the colonies to come up. So you could do an experiment and in two days get the results. And so that, you know, the, the, the fun of thinking with students about ideas and experiments and doing them and getting the results within a couple of days and just just that constant iterative intellectual activity was just so much fun. And um, I'm actually trying to create that environment again in a different context, but that I think was really what made life great. <laughs> yeah, I, the thing I remember along those lines is that we had a model uh, of the cy cycle very early and every morning that model would be up under the clock in, in the main lab that you were in and people would go out and test aspects of the model and then refine it and it, it didn't go quite as fast as every two days we refined it but over the course of time we refined it and, and, and that sort of led to the model that got published in science and, and yeah and it was just it was such a fun group when we first got started because you were there Lena Hereford Joe Collati John Pringle came in pretty close pretty soon yeah. um, and you know so we were just having lots of fun identifying new mutants and trying to figure out how they fit into the whole thing and you know, interestingly, one of the I thought the most interesting result was there was a mutant CDC4, which would not go through DNA replication, but would sit there and bud periodically. So it was there was identified some kind of clock in the cell. To my knowledge, nobody has yet understood anything about that. And it's so it's it's just one of those it's it's neat. That's a neat thing about science is some of these observations just sit there. They're really interesting, and they they just don't get solved, you know. That is true. Uh, mm -hmm. And and do you remember what you called that? No. You called it a Sisyphus. It kept trying to do a cell oh, cycle, <laughs> <laughs> and it never made it. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So um, then, I was gone during this period, so I'm going to really explore this, but. There, there seem to be other interests. You got a, a fair amount interested in yeast mating factor, and did a lot of work with that. Uh, how did that? That obviously dovetailed with the cell cycle, but how, how did that sort of advance? Uh, well, the, the mating type work came because uh, because of the fact that the mating factor interrupted the cell cycle and interrupted it in G1. And so then we got interested in the other mating factor, and it also interrupted in G1. And of course, your thesis was all about the fact that mating was limited to that stage in the cell cycle where the pheromones synchronized the two cell cycles, so the two cells would be at the same stage when they nuclei fused. So it makes all sense, and it's a very, very pretty system. But that got us into mating. and. And I think some of the most fun experiments we did that, again, I don't think have been followed up very much, 
were experiments looking at how cells make choices about mating. And um, Kathy Jackson and, um, uh, and um, Shrick, what was Catherine. Catherine Shrick, yeah, did, did some really nice experiments in Rus uh, Russell Dorr too, where what you do is you mix cells together so you could take an A cell, for example, and give it two different alpha cells of different genotypes and ask which ones it chose to mate with and what genes influenced that choice and all that kind of polarity stuff. And I still, th I st had a very hard time thinking about it because you, you can think about one cell making a choice, but actually both cells are making a choice. And that's kind of hard to think about for me. And so, um, uh, but anyway, I, I just think there was loads of things more to be done with that approach that I don't think has been followed up. I, I think that was actually more interesting in some ways than the cell cycle work. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, it, the cell cycle certainly caught on. But <laughs> <laughs> and, and there were also studies going on that integrated that with growth control. John Pringle and I think other people were involved in that. So it was central. Do you, do you have any comments about cells growth control? Because yeah, John did a lot of nice work on that, and what he showed was that if you take cells that are randomly distributed in the cycle and you starve them of anything, sulfate, phosphate, nitrogen, anything except glucose, the cells, even though they can't grow, they'll finish the cycle. And if they have a little tiny bud, they'll stuff a nucleus into it, and all the cells will go into G1. So there's this regulation of the cell cycle by, by nutrition as well as by mating factor. And, um, and I think that's another area where there's probably a lot more known about that now, but I haven't followed it. Yeah. Okay, and, and you know, who were the members of the department at that time? and, and you know, how how did the department interact with that research? Who who did you talk to about that research and other research and other research problems? How well, as I say, you know, the uh, I, I just found the department such a rich intellectual environment, and especially probably because I was naive about genetics, and so I really interacted, I think, with everybody. You know, um, uh, Herschel and, and Don, of course, um, but, you know, Larry Sandler, I frequently drop by Larry's office and have questions for him. You know, uh, the human stuff that was going on in Stan's lab was interesting. And, um, uh, and of course, L Breck and Walt, who were working very closely on yeast, um, and been on the molecular side of things. Um, and, you know, I, I think I learned from everybody in the department uh, and, and on a fairly regular basis had, I mean, I had pretty broad interests. On a fairly regular basis, I was learning things from people, you know, throughout the department. And you had quite... Don was the most fun person to learn things from. I asked from. about Don. I was going to ask yeah. about Don. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I, I, was, I was actually, Brian and I were talking about this the other day, but the experience is, if you, if, when you went to Larry Sandler and asked him a question, you'd get a textbook answer. Larry would cite you the experiments, the observations, and why this led to this, and this is very clear. It was just like a lecture. You know, to sit you down and give you a clear lecture. And when you went to Don, <laughs> Don would sort of look at you and sort of go off like this, and he'd go, well, in 1961, <laughs> I made a cross <laughs> between a strain that had a suppressor and a strain that didn't. And he'd go on for an hour or so telling you all the results, and then it was up to you to figure out how that was relevant to your question. <laughs> 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 Don was legendary. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, 
how, how did Herschel influence you and, and the faculty? Well, um, Herschel, uh, you know, very directly because, um, as I say, when I first got interested in yeast, I, his name was prominent in the literature, and I just called him up out of the blue, didn't know him, he didn't know me, and he was so generous. He said, oh, come up, you've got to spend a few days, and so I came up, and I, you know, had lots of questions, and, and in fact, it's not exactly the way it went. The, when I called him up, I had a list of questions in front of me. And I said, can I ask you a few questions? And he said, yeah. And so I started my first question. My second question said, wait a minute. He said, I think you better come up. <laughs> 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 so I did. And they sent, Don and Herschel sent me back to Irvine with a Dafon Brune micro manipulator, which, you know, is sort of like, you know, in those days, an electron microscope. I mean, it was a very sophisticated thing. And you didn't have, they only had a couple of them. So, I mean, that's how generous uh, they were. And, and then, I don't know, it was a year or two, or maybe three, two or three years later that Herschel called me up and asked me if I'd be interested in joining the department. And I um, said I didn't know. So I, I, I came up and spent a summer, fell in love with Seattle and the trees and greenery and the department and was fortunate enough to come back. I didn't know that. So <laughs> that, one of my questions was how you got here, and now we know the answer to that. Yeah, one. yeah, no, it was, uh, and it was Herschel. Yeah, and your research changed over time, and it's got to, it's <laughs> got to, and and what what new projects did you take on uh, uh, that that you remember, and and what were your, some of your major findings? I can. Uh, for example, well, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking, but I know what I want to say, uh, <laughs> which is, um, Good question. you know, that it's true that you know, it, whenever you go into academic science, you, you have to change your projects every few years, um, and that process of, you know, when you're when you do a postdoc, if the if if you don't generate your own ideas, if you're given ideas, and you, you know, then you're successful and you become an academic scientist, you may fail because you haven't had the experience of having to think of projects. And so I, I always had my graduate students and postdocs think of their own projects. And sometimes very frustrating. I mean, you know, I remember Mandy Polovich, God, it took her over two years to come up with a project. I mean, not because she wasn't smart. She's smart as a cracker. But she kept starting a project and, and, and showing that it wouldn't work, and then going on to another one showing that it wouldn't work. But I do think that that is a, an essential process of training, that you have to realize how frustrating and hard it is to come up with a new idea and to execute it. And so, you know, I think the things that came out of the lab and the way it evolved were really largely due to the ideas of the students. You know. Okay. And and when did you become interested in genome fidelity? Yeah. Um, well, I, I think it was a, a a very early interest in that I remember when when I was postdoc with Renato De Becco that. He was very interested in the phenomenon of chromosome instability in cancer. I thought that was fundamental, and that was in the back of my mind somewhere. But you know, it was a long time before we ever started studying it. And then, when we did start studying, that was very deliberate. And I remember spending a lot of time talking with Larry about recombination and, and mitotic recombination and you know, chromosome mechanics and everything, and trying to think about how could you use the ways that were used to study meiosis to study mitosis. And of course, Herschel did mitotic recombination all the time, so I had that as a model. Um, but it, it's funny, it took, it took us quite a while to actually figure out how to, how to make it work. But that was the David Smith paper, is that correct? 
Is that where it first emerged? Um, may have been, may have been the first time. In that, we, we looked at all the cell cycle mutants and grew them at a rate limiting temperature. David did, and looked at the effects on recombination and chromosome loss. And almost all the mutants had very high levels of recombination or chromosome loss. So that sort of said that that was going to be a fruitful approach. The reason I'm kind of pushing this uh, a little bit is that when I left uh, the department, I was influenced by uh, some work that Stan had published and, and also by Phil Fialco, where they were calling attention to cancer as a disease of somatic evolution with genomic instability. And that didn't make the literature until after I left when Peter Knoll published his big classic paper. And so you got that from uh, Renato as a basis. Is that Certainly correct? Certainly, I think that's probably the first place that I became aware of that as a fundamental part of cancer. And, and, and because at that time, there was no pa cancer paper that I'm aware of that studied genome-wide chromosome instability. Uh, and I was looking for those papers. So uh, I, that was a ma major advance uh, that I, I think was made with that paper. And that's one of the reasons I bring it up. The, the other one that I, I'm sort of interested in is uh, along a little bit after that paper, I got a phone call from you asking me if I'd ever seen any evidence that G2 was involved in cancer. and and. You want to go into that cells rest in G2 being involved in cancer. Um, let's see. I, I remember the f I remember the phone call, and I remember the um, the the work um, the work that Ted Weiner did that yes. identified uh, DNA damage checkpoint in G2, and we had been influenced by. Uh, some paper is in the literature on G2 delay in mammalian cells. And I forget who, do you remember Stan who did that work? Yeah, but anyway, it was very, it really, really made, impressed me the fact that um, cancer cells tended to accumulate in G2. And um, and so we thought a lot about that. And Ted, when he came into the lab, said he, he didn't want to study the cell cycle. He wanted to study the regulation of the cell cycle. So this seemed like regulation. Okay, And um, somehow that led to that whole project. Okay. And, and the, uh, by the way, the way tell, Ted, tells me that story is it took a long time, almost as long as Mandy's project, <laughs> walking around talking about that project to get it going. Is it, do, do you have that memory of a long time No, going? but Ted was a very impatient guy. It was probably only a few months. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the You've alluded that you have a couple of papers that have an interesting history that uh, that you that didn't go anywhere scientifically, but you ha had that. Do you yeah, uh, I actually actually mentioned both of them. I think the the CDC4 phenomenon, the the whatever clock is exists there is one of them that is, I think, just sort of frozen in time. And then um, uh, the other one was the whole um, question of, of polarity and signaling and mating, which may have been followed up more, but, but I, I, you know, for many years nobody really followed up other than, you know, treating cells with pheromone. And looking at the growth, but I mean this whole business of of giving of of putting cells into a field of other cells and asking which choices they make and what 
what genes and the signaling pathway influence that is the other thing that I that I, I think really you know Kathy Jackson's work and others just sort of opened a field that sort of never got explored. I don't I don't know why that puzzles me. Yeah, it uh, it does seem interesting that some papers languish for a long time and others take off. It's almost faddish in a way. Uh, the um, um well, I think there are trends, you know, and the trends have to do with the way people approach science. And if if you happen, if the approach is fits the major trend, then everybody picks it up and does it, you know. But if it's a different approach that is not part of the trend, then people don't even notice it. We've seen in your career extraordinarily rapid changes in genetics. And um, the, um, what do you see as the major breakthroughs that we've seen in genetics over this 40 year, 45 year period that you and I have known each other? Well, I think in terms of breakthroughs, certainly molecular technology. But the, I mean, the big breakthrough was Watson and Crick. I mean, you know, what a paper. I mean, a paper that, you know, in like three or four pages set the future for studying evolution, replication, um, you know, um, mutation, information. Um, you know, it just all goes back to that date. And, and that was so fascinating to me in my, in my, my career because I became, um, I, I went to Caltech in 1957 and graduated in 61. And Crick actually came through and gave a lecture to my undergraduate, to an undergraduate class I was in. And he posed the problem of the um, commaless code. Can you come up with a code that is commaless, you know? And just as a challenge to the students. And so, you know, so my career started just about the time that DNA had defined the questions. The DNA structure had defined the questions. And, you know, and I've seen in my lifetime now, you know, the sequencing of the human genome. And um, what's going to happen in the next 50 years? You know, just how can we imagine? We can't possibly imagine, right? And in fact, if I'd had any good sense, I probably wouldn't have started the cell cycle work we did when we did because it couldn't go anywhere without DNA technology. And that certainly we couldn't see DNA technology coming. And, you know, so I think we, we can't estimate the incredible rate at which science progresses and, and where it'll lead us. Um, you know, so, you know, just to me, it's just mind boggling to realize that, you know, when I was in high school, we did not understand the molecular nature of heredity. And now we have a sequence of the human genome. You know, I, I just, you know, wow. Do you see limitations? I, I think I think the limitations are in our minds. That um, when when I was an undergraduate, it seemed like biology was sort of facing two directions. One was gene regulation and the other was morphogenesis. Okay. And everybody went in the gene regulation direction. And almost nothing has happened in the morphogenesis direction. You know, a little bit of pro protein structure and stuff, but the whole thing of how you put together biological structures. And for example, you know, we tend to think that the DNA contains all the information for making an organism. Not true. It starts with an egg. You know, there's an incredible amount of structure in that egg that probably goes back, you know, a billion years. 
I mean, continuously structural heredity. So, you know, there's a whole area that never got explored. And um, so, so, yeah, I think that we, we move in incredibly rapid progress in the directions we choose to go, but we ignore vast areas and don't even think about them. And is that going to take another technological breakthrough? No, it takes an intellectual breakthrough. It means, you know, somebody's got to stop and say, hey, wait a minute, you guys, this is interesting, and I'm going to study it. And so uh, do you see any of those things happening now? Oh, I'm sure it is. I'm not reading the literature much in biology anymore. You're now doing something totally different and uh, taking a new direction. And tell us what you're interested in now and and what you're doing now. Well, so uh, I've got a little bit going on in terms of biology and medicine. As You know, I was a director at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center for more than a decade and did that because I wanted to learn more about how biology could influence medicine or did influence medicine. And I came out of that experience feeling that what's deficient in medicine is diagnostics. That there's way too much emphasis on therapeutics, late stage disease intervention, and not enough on the information we need to diagnose disease. Information is, is just not being really explored. So. One of the things I do is I work with a couple of institutes in Asia developing molecular diagnostics. Um, but my real passion right now is, is in teaching, and uh, I'm really interested in the whole issue of sustainability. That is, the fact that the human population has just reached the planet's capacity to support it. And we are now using all available cropland, forest land, fresh water with a population of 9 billion people or 7 billion people going to 9 or 10 billion people. And we just reached it. It just, just happened. Okay? So what's the future? Uh, and, and the other part of that is that only a small percentage of the people like us really participate in the bounty of that. 40% of the population of the world still lives on less than $2 a day. So they're not participating in the resources even that the Earth has to offer. So this whole issue of how do we create a sustainable society that can live within the bounds of what the Earths can provide is, is a really fundamental question for the next generation. And um, so the, the way I'm trying to approach that is it seems to me a lot of the answers are scientific and technological, and yet most of the public, like 99%, don't really appreciate science or technology. 60% of them don't believe in evolution. Um, so how is that politic going to grapple with these enormous problems. And so the way I've decided to try to, you know, perform in that arena is to, to educate teachers. So I'm working um, on a course called Sustainability Science for Teachers at Arizona State University, which is the largest teacher training university in the country. They, they train 1,500 teachers a year, um, and just getting started in that, but learning a lot about online education, about the incredible capabilities of information technology for, um, for education, um, and, and have a group, a small group of students, some of whom are uh, graduate students in sustainability and therefore content experts, some of whom are in more of the arts, in 
you know, um, film editing and graphics design and things like that. And trying to recreate that fun we had in the first years uh, in the genetics department where it's kind of a free-for-all of ideas. And, you know, I feel like education and learning are, you know, really very, very primitive in our understanding. And it's another area where it doesn't really help to read much of the literature. You know, I think it's a field that still needs to be created in some way. And what does a graduate student in sustainability study? <laughs> what, what are the projects? <laughs> and oh. do they take the same length of time to develop as the cell cycle did? <laughs> oh, they may study, you know, water quality or, you know, ecology or the urban environment or how policy gets made. I mean, you know, it's, it's essentially everything about how humans interact with the planet. That's a big task. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you all. Great. Thanks, Brian.